Welcome to today's webinar entitled Optimization of Nocturnal Blood Pressure Assessment and Treatment, Innovation Beyond Ambulatory Blood Pressure Monitoring. I'm Gianfranco Peratti, I'm Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Milano Bicocca, and my Head of the Cardiology Unit and Scientific Director of the Clinical Research Institution in Milano, the Instituto Oxologico Italiano. I'm delighted to be joined today by Professor Francesco Capuccio, Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at University of Warwick, Cardiovascular Medicine and Epidemiology, sorry Francesco, I'm very happy you join us. Hello. And also, I'm happy to have with us Dr. Martino Pengo, consultant physician in uh, the same scientific institution, the Instituto Oxologico Italiano in Milan. Today's session is brought to you by Red Week Cardiology and is supported by OM, which I want to thank. OM is supporting this uh, teaching uh, experience, offering us the possibility to discuss important issues related to sleep medicine. Before we start, I would like to quickly remind uh, everybody of the agenda. We have a short introduction, which is what we're doing now. Then my lecture on the nocturnal blood pressure and cardiovascular risk assessment. Then uh, Francesco Capuccio is going to discuss how sleep disturbance might affect nighttime blood pressure. And then Martino will discuss how can routine blood pressure measurement improve the management in hypertension. Then we'll have a short uh, question and answer session and a final uh, wrap-up uh, summary. Today, the learning objectives are summarized in these titles, and they are shown again here, just to remind you of the importance of the topics we are going to discuss, but this is going to be an interactive session. So you are warmly invited to put questions to the faculty. You can submit your question in a form on the website, so we'll be able to see them and provide an answer at the end of the session. So let me start now with my own lecture. I'm going to discuss with you the importance of nocturnal blood pressure in cardiovascular risk assessment. Why should we measure blood pressure during sleep? Well, there is a quantitative reason, very simple. We spend at least one third of our life sleeping, so it's important to know what happens during sleep. Then sleep itself uh, is a very complex phenomenon with the involvement of many neural mechanisms regulating the cardiovascular system. And someone was suggesting sleep as a nice model to investigate neural cardiovascular control. We also need on a clinical side to understand why different types of cardiovascular events have a different frequency between sleep and wake and why having cardiorespiratory alteration during sleep might on turn affect cardiovascular function and be responsible for many changes in cardiovascular disease assessment. This is just a, a graphic summary of what happens during sleep. You see in the upper part the sleep stages going from the sleep wakefulness, so called, then stage one, two, three, and four, progressively deeper sleep stages, and then REM sleep. And you find uh, by just watching the blood pressure tracing bit by bit recording here, the blood pressure is tendentially going lower when you go from early and uh, very light sleep to deep sleep. But when you enter REM sleep, you find a thicker line, which means tachycardia, more waves, and a higher blood pressure. So it's a very complex regulation we have to face. What is the clinical impact of this? Well, many studies show that the information you get on nighttime blood pressure is a predictor of risk and can predict cardiovascular mortality better than other blood pressure measurements. In this slide, taken from the Pamela study in the area north of Milan, you find an increasing 11-year risk of cardiovascular mortality for a 10 millimeter mercury increase in different types of blood pressure, office, home, daytime, 24-hour and nighttime blood pressure. And you see that the nighttime blood pressure is always the best predictor of mortality when you consider this progressive increase. Similar messages coming from this slide taken from the Sistio study, a study carried out in Europe years ago in elderly people with isolated systolic hypertension. At that time, it was possible to have a placebo group. And you find here the two years events rate based on different types of blood pressure measurement again 
This is the impact of office blood pressure at the bottom. We find a correlation of mortality, but a weak one. Then you have daytime blood pressure, 24 hour, and finally nighttime blood pressure, which is again the best predictor of mortality also in this particular setting. Another example, the Dublin outcome study. 10,000 people in the city of Dublin followed up for 10 years. Again, you find the different blood pressure and their ability to predict uh, cardiovascular mortality. And again, you find nighttime blood pressure to be the best predictor. So if you have any doubt, you can really be convinced here that measuring nighttime blood pressure is clinically important. Again, the Pamela study try to provide a similar graphic experience. You find, again, more or less the same as in the Dublin study, showing the different impact of mortality of different blood pressure measurement. Again, nighttime blood pressure is in uh, systolic and diastolic, always the best predictor of mortality. The uh, guidelines we published year, years ago on ambulatory blood pressure monitor were acknowledging this importance, emphasizing that measuring nocturnal blood pressure can provide superior information in cardiovascular risk prediction and can also give you some indirect possible information on the risk of having also sleep-related breathing disorders. Not only the mean pressure is important when you focus on the night, but also the dynamics the pattern in changing of blood pressure between day and night. And you find in green the classic blood pressure profile in a normal individual with a nocturnal reduction at night, the so-called dipping phenomenon. While in some people, you find here a red line showing this behavior, blood pressure is not going to be reduced. These are the so-called non-dippers. This is not just a descriptive phenomenon, it has an impact on risk. Well, between day and night, there are many possible phenomena occurring. This is a quite complex slide by Professor Cario, again showing the different patterns at night. You can be a dipper, you can be an extreme dipper, more than 20% of the daytime values in terms of reduction. You can be a non-dipper, less than 10% of the daytime values, or you can be a riser with an increase in the night. And on top of this, you might have nighttime surges due to blood pressure variability, then followed by the, the steep increase in pressure when you wake up in the morning. All these different patterns have been shown in many studies to have a prognostic impact. And just a few examples, that's again the CISTIO study in the elderly, and you find that after accounting for the 24-hour mean historic blood pressure levels on the right-hand side, an increase in night-to-day ratio, which means an increase in nocturnal blood pressure and the reduction in dipping, was associated with a clear increase in cardiovascular events, in particular stroke. This is taken again from the OASAMA study in Japan, a population study that was following people for many, many years. Again, you find the different patterns in their ability to predict all-cause cardiovascular mortality and non-cardiovascular mortality. For all causes and cardiovascular mortality, you find that the highest risk was carried by it being non deeper or inverse deeper, which means a riser with a nighttime increase in blood pressure. And when you focus on the ambulatory blood pressure profile, this can appear very clearly, very simply, even at inspection of the profile. In this example, you clearly find a blood pressure increase in the night rather than a decrease. And this is often observed in obese people when they have obstructive sleep apnea. This slide is just providing an explanation for this phenomenon. When an obese subject is sleeping supine, as in this photo here, you might see an occlusion of the upper airway without uh, the uh, bone structure of the wall. And any of these obstructive events is accompanied by a stop in airflow, a reduction in oxygen saturation, which is stimulating the chemoreflex, the peripheral chemoreceptors. And in turn, when you then start breathing again, this is followed by a blood pressure rise. If you zoom into this, you understand how complex the situation can be. You find here a five-minute recording with six apneas, so a very severe obstructive sleep apnea. And clearly, you see that any time there was an oxygen desaturation due to apnea, this was followed by a blood pressure peak. So you have this so of behavior of blood pressure and increased blood pressure variability, which is clearly associated with a higher risk of events, 
and was responsible also for the increase in mean nocturnal blood pressure levels shown in the previous slide. Focusing just on variability, which can be an epiphenomenon of the sleep apnea behavior shown before, this paper by Paolo Palatini clearly showed that whenever you have an increase in nighttime systolic on the left or diastolic on the right blood pressure variability, this was associated again with an increase in the risk of fetal and non-fetal cardiovascular events, even when you were accounting for the difference in mean blood pressure levels. So also the dynamics of blood pressure at night can carry important prognostic information. In the uh, practice guideline we published in 2014 on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, we focused on this and were emphasizing the importance of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring to pick up phenomena such as nocturnal hypertension or changes in the blood pressure behavior between day and night. Now we have an additional pos possibility. That's my last slide. You know, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is certainly the best possible solution to investigate the blood pressure patterns between day and night, but it's not always available in many countries. And sometimes it's not even well tolerated by patients because they don't like having a arm cuff inflating repeatedly during the night. So technology is helping us. Now we have this device, the night view device, which is a home blood pressure monitor at the wrist level, which is programmed to provide automated measurements during the night at least three times. And this can be easily provided to patients at home to have information on nocturnal blood pressure, not just on one night, but on different nights, which can provide reproducible information. and might help us screening for different behaviors of blood pressure during night sleep. I hope this might help you also in your clinical practice to get more and easier information on nocturnal blood pressure behavior. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Professor Parati. Uh, it's very clear. I just wanted to remind the audience that uh, today's session is interactive. So should you have any questions you'd like to put to the faculty, please submit them in the form of on the web page and we'll address as many as possible towards the end of this talk. And I hope we'll have enough time to uh, satisfy all the queries. Now, next, I'm going to take over on my talk, um, can I have a first slide, please? Yeah. Now I'm trying to address the issue: how does a sleep disturbance uh, affect blood pressure um, uh, during the night, in particular? Now, if I can have the next slide here. So this slide addresses the question: first of all, how much sleep do we need? Let's start from very far away. Over the history, humans have adopted different patterns of sleep. We know that if we do not sleep, we die. And that is an essential part. And as Professor Parati suggested, we spend a third of our lives asleep. However, how much is this the optimal requirement? We don't really know. So if we take the epidemiology and the observation of patterns of sleep, uh, currently, in the westernized populations, we detect a bell-shaped distribution of hours of sleep, with an average sleep duration being clustered around six to eight hours per night, with an average of seven hours per night, as we see in this slide taken from a British population. If we look at an American study, on the right-hand side, that we have a similar bell-shaped curve. This time, you will notice that the average time is eight hours per night, Although in this study, uh, the sleeping time was taken over the weekend, emphasizing the habit of catching up on weekends. However, the point I want to make here, that whilst the majority of the population sleeps around six to eight hours, we have significant tails on other side, which incorporate about 25% of the population. So one in four people sleep either less or more than that. So we can call them short sleepers or long sleepers, just for simplicity. Now, this slide reports the summary of uh, the epidemiological evidence in prospective studies showing that sustained sleep deprivation leads to increased morbidity and mortality from cardiometabolic causes. In fact, in prospective studies 
short duration of sleep, anyone sleeping less than five hours per night, tend to uh, suffer more like, well, it's more likely to suffer from uh, obesity in a sort of incident cases, so developing obesity, developing hypertension, developing diabetes, and furthermore, short duration of sleep um, on the chronic stage predicts an increased risk of developing fatal and unfatal coronary heart disease, strokes, and surprisingly, when we showed that premature death within 12 years of observation. The effects are strong, as given by these relative risk estimates, and are therefore significant from the public health viewpoint. Sleeping less than the norm also leads to the development of high blood pressure we've seen. And in this meta-analysis of prospective studies, we see that the risk can be estimated about 20% over just five years of follow-up, if you regularly sleep less than five hours per night. Short duration of sleep has an effect on blood pressure very early in life. In adolescents, followed up for five years in the cardiac study here, short duration of sleep, which was measured with actigraphy, so it is a more precise measure compared to self-reported sleep duration in previous studies, predicted the rise in blood pressure occurring with age that we see in the top graph, and improved also sleep maintenance as we see in the bottom graph. And furthermore, as a third element from the epidemiology, in, in the study of older men who underwent polysomnography, which is obviously the gold standard for assessing also the phases of sleep, and they were then followed up for about four years, short sleep was shown to be a good predictor of hypertension. In addition, however, this study also showed that the reduction in sleep, which was causing uh, the, the causal relationship with the incident cases of hypertension was mainly due to a reduction in a slow wave sleep, which is considered to be the more restorative and deeper stage of sleep. You see. Okay. Now, a randomized clinical trial is the ultimate proof of causality. Now, this study is one of the early and few controlled trials of sleep extension in healthy volunteers. Uh, two groups were randomized to either maintain their sleep duration, about six and a half hours per night, or extend it by one hour per night. And 24 hour blood pressure was measured at baseline and after six weeks. Now, this slide shows systolic and diastolic blood pressure at baseline in the blue graph and the follow up in the red. In the sleep maintenance group on the left, and in the sleep extension group on the right. A period of sleep extension, as we see on the right hand side for both systolic and diastolic, caused a significant fall in blood pressure across day as well as night. Uh, the intervention was able to extend the total sleeping time by an average of 30 minutes per night. And this study, one of the very few that shows how directly if we manage to restore sleep deprivation we are able to improve blood pressure uh, patterns even in normal tensive people. The next scheme, which I'll show you, um, summarizes the wealth of evidence accumulated in the past 20 years, extended the concept that sleep disturbances are not only a problem for the brain and confined to the nervous system. Sleep disturbances involve almost every system and organ of the body from the heart, the vasculature, the GI system, adipose tissue, liver, pancreas, kidneys, muscles, white cells, with far-reaching consequences in the short and the longer term. Blood pressure variation. Blood pressure variation over 24 hours follows a pattern, as we have seen already this slide before, with a peak in the early morning, called the morning surge, and a decrease at night, the dipping. The morning surge is caused by a variety of mechanisms, which are mainly highlighted in the pink box. The nocturnal dipping, which is normally should be above 10% of the daytime blood pressure, 
is also due to a variety of mechanisms, as we see in the blue box. The, tip, the dipping could be, in some cases, quite extreme, exceeding 20% of the daytime blood pressure, or could be blunted, like in non-dippers, or even inverted, causing the rising blood pressure at night. And in some circumstances, as we see in the red box, a nocturnal surge can occur. These variations are the results of two uh, events. One is an endogenous circadian rhythm, which exerts its peak at around 9 p.m. And one is due to behavioral effects that are superimposed onto the circadian rhythm. The one is regulated by our internal uh, body clock. Blood pressure starts declining from late evening onwards, reaches a nadir around midnight, and rises just after awakening in the morning. Now, one common chronic condition we've already heard from Professor Parati introducing this concept, one common con chronic condition frequently associated with hypertension and high nocturnal blood pressure is obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA for short. Uh, OSA is a sleep disorder. It's characterized by frequent episodes of partial or complete collapse of the upper airway during sleep. These obstructions cause cessations of airflow, as we've heard already, disturbances in gas exchange with hypoxia, frequent arousals, and often snoring. And during these episodes, the patient experiences recurrent cycles of oxygen desaturations, we've seen the graph quite clearly, with sympathetic overactivity and metabolic effects. These recurrent cycles of oxygen desaturation cause sleep fragmentation related to the arousals, restless sleep and frequent arousals, fatigue, excessive daytime sleepiness, poor concentration, reduced performance, atten attentional failures with the risk of road traffic accidents and overall reduced quality of life. So really a huge and comprehensive syndrome they're very much underestimated until recently. Now, the next stage is that at the same time, OSA activates a variety of mechanisms. We've seen some indicated in the earlier talk, like increased sympathetic overactivity, activation of metabolic effects, endothelial dysfunction, and inflammation, causing a variety of consequences like hypertension, with a high nocturnal blood pressure, in fact, in an obstructive sleep apnea, uh, non-dipping is very common. We can have nocturia, night sweats, glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, weight gain, and diabetes. And with all these uh, happening, if it's sustained chronically, in the long term, if not adequately treated, sleep apnea syndrome increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Indeed, there is a strong and graded relationship between presence and severity of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome and the occurrence of new cases of hypertension or else incidence of hypertension. The incidence of hypertension increases with the severity of the respiratory disease, which is measured by the apnea hypopnea index or AHI which reflects the average, the average number of apneas per hour. In moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, the incidence of hypertension may reach between 70 and 90 percent in a study of follow-up of 15 years, which is not insignificant. And likewise, there is a strong and graded relationship, as you would expect, between the presence and severity of obstructive sleep apnea and the risk of all-cause mortality and cardiovascular death in particular. So finally, we must briefly address the recurrent question, does it matter what time we prescribe antihypertensive medication for what we've heard? We have seen so far that high nocturnal blood pressure is more closely associated with fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events than daytime ambulatory blood pressure. 
However, 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring may also cause sleep disturbances in many patients, and it has a rather poor reproducibility within individuals. The current guidelines provide guidance of benefits based on the response of daytime blood pressure to the administration of drugs usually given in the morning. Thus, lowering high nocturnal blood pressure administering antihypertensive medications in the evening reduce the risk of event as much or more than lowering daytime blood pressure by administering blood pressure medications in the morning? That is a key question. The answer could only come from well-conducted large randomized clinical trials of long duration. I want to take you through very briefly the fact that recently a Spanish group has published data from the MAPEC study suggesting that administering blood pressure medications in the evening to over 2,000 patients with hypertension was more effective than morning dosing. Uh, it also reduced cardiovascular events more. They then published another study called the HIGIA study, which I showed you here, in which over 19,000 patients were studied in the primary care setting. The authors reported Surprisingly, that the evening dosing compared to morning administration reduced nocturnal blood pressure by three over two millimeters of mercury, approximately, compared to morning dosing, with no difference in daytime blood pressure, the ones we use to really gauge the need for drug therapy and the achievements of targets. And surprisingly, that small additional difference in nocturnal blood pressure reduction was associated with a a nearly halving of the rate of cardiovascular events over six years. However, I want to warn you because the study has several flaws in design, analysis, and reporting. Now, after a rapid perusal of this study, the scientific community raised further doubts concerning the ethics of this study, the randomization, and more importantly, the plausibility of the results which have led to questioning the credibility of these results and an investigation has been launched, the results of which are still awaited. In the meantime, the questions are very important to answer and more trials are ongoing. And one is the very large trial on 21,000 hypertensives called the TIME study. The results will hopefully be available in a couple of years. Until then, the recommendations are to administer blood pressure medications in the morning. And I conclude with this summary slide, which I want to leave you with four take-home messages. First one is that disrupted sleep, whether because it's short in quantity or poor in quality, contributes to cardiovascular risk and disease. Blood pressure varies from day to night and usually is measured by 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. However, we are now aware that this particular procedure, very helpful from the clinical point of view, um, may interfere with sleep, may cause patients from microarousals and disturb sleep, and has a low reproducibility within individual. But we also know that these sleep disturbances increase nocturnal blood pressure. So uh, an improvement in the assessment of blood pressure at night would be very welcome. Now, I also said that one of the commonest comorbidities uh, uh, of hypertension, which lead to almost invariably high nocturnal blood pressure sleep apnea syndrome, which increases the risk of hypertension, but it's also more common in hypertension, and both leads to cardiovascular disease. So finally, I think we need within this field to improve our detection of nocturnal blood pressure and the understanding of the fluctuation in relation to sleep stages and sleep patterns. So we need accurate and unbiased assessment of nocturnal blood pressure. And I would say uh, the advice would be to have continuous readings, also synchronous with the sleep pattern and the sleep phases, with an integrated measure of both sleep duration and quality with blood pressure and possibly heart rate. And I pause here. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Capuccio, for this uh, extremely interesting lecture, actually giving us much more details on the importance of assessing what happens during sleep. And now I'm very happy to introduce the last speaker today, Dr. Martino Pengo, who is going to give us a presentation on how can routine nocturnal blood pressure measurement improve the management of hypertensive patients. Please, Martino. Thank you very much, Professor Parati. Uh, after these two fantastic presentations, I'm going to uh, try to convince you or, or at least uh, explain why I believe it's important to um, measure routinely in our patients' uh, nocturnal blood pressure measurements, uh, measure blood pressure at night, of course, um, because I, I believe that this could be of help uh, in uh, a better phenotypization of our patients that we see uh, routinely in clinic. Now, um, I will try to give you some answers to the question, which is the title of my presentation. And the first uh, answer could be that uh, measuring routinely nocturnal blood pressure can allow us to de determine um, uh, the nocturnal blood pressure profile without disturbing the patient's sleep. We know that uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is indeed uh, the gold standard uh, up to now for uh, nocturnal blood pressure um, a measurement. However, it can disturb our patients. Some of our patients are complaining of disturbed sleep during the test. And this is one of the first studies published uh, ages ago, but uh, still uh, interesting uh, because it tells us that, uh, of course, the uh, uh, devices that, that we use for um, a blood pressure margin can in, in fact disturb blood pressure, causing arousal from sleep and therefore increasing blood pressure uh, by, as you can see, uh, almost 10 millimeters of mercury uh, as far as systolic blood pressure is concerned. So certainly um, uh, this test uh, is important, uh, but of course it can uh, give us a different picture of what is the no real nocturnal blood pressure of our patients. And in fact, um, we have seen this slide before, uh, if we measure uh, with a beat to beat device, we see that blood pressure varies quite, uh, uh, quite frequently during the night according to sleep stages, uh, to the wake stage, for example, after arousals. So it's very important to uh, try to categorize a much, uh, as much as we can blood pressure at night, because what we see uh, in our um, um, blood, blood pressure me measurements is just uh, a line, but in fact, uh, many variations can be uh, uh, caused by, for example, sleep disorders, as we have seen uh, pre in the previous present presentation. So, um, um, measuring blood pressure with a few measurements, but repeated uh, during the days, uh, instead of a, a unique measurement uh, uh, during uh, many times at night, can in fact give us a different picture and perhaps uh, helping understanding the blood pressure profile of our patients. Um, in fact, uh, a, a study published a couple of years ago uh, showed that um, in some cases, um, a risk cuff system can be less disturbing at night compared to the standard cuff systems. Uh, this is a, a small study, but in in fact, uh, can uh, help us understanding that maybe a, a wrist cuff uh, a base device can be of help in terms of uh, less intrusive with regards to, uh, to the measurement and most of all with regards to uh, not affecting uh, the sleep of our patients. So the second answer that I, I, I'll try to uh, give to, to the, 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 the main question is that uh, in some cases, uh, measuring nocturnal blood pressure routinely can improve patient adherence to, be, to blood pressure medication. So we know this already from studies conducting in home blood pressure monitoring, where um, uh, even a recent meta-analysis published, uh, including 28 trials, showed that <laughs> there was a significant uh, effect on home blood pressure monitoring in medication adherence that we know is very important in our patients. We know that is one of the, of the causes of resistant hypertension and is something that we fight against on, on, on our daily uh, practice. Uh, so 
adding nocturnal blood pressure measurement on top of, of course, diurnal blood pressure ma measurement can be even more informative for the patient and, and can uh, uh, even increase the patient perception of their hypertension status and therefore encourage them to be compliant with the uh, uh, anti-hypertensive uh, treatment in particular. Um, another a possible uh, reason why we should uh, measure routinely nocturnal blood pressure could be uh, that in this way we can overcome the low uh, reproducibility of uh, a BPM. We know that this is an issue that we have been discussing for ages. So uh, reproducibility, which is uh, the variation observed when different operators uh, measure the same part using the same device, in this case measure blood pressure, is some, something that can affect precision. Okay, so precision is important, of course, uh, because we want, in theory, of uh, our device to be uh, uh, accurate and precise, but unfortunately, um, uh, the lack of, a, uh, um, of, a, of an optimal reproducibility for ABPMs uh, does not allow us to, uh, to reach a proper precision. So one way could be, of course, to repeat the test many times. So if we repeat uh, nocturnal blood pressure me measurements over time, in this way, of course, we do not affect the accuracy because that is more related to the device and to the test itself. But, it is, uh, but we can certainly increase a precision, improve precision. Uh, and we know how, preci how precision is important in terms of classifying our patients. Low precision can uh, uh, um, uh, impact on the classification on the dipping status, for example. And we know from the studies conducted by Professor Kuspiti and colleagues that uh, understanding whether the, a patient is a real dipper or a real non-dipper is quite important. So in this study in uh, uh, 375 never treated uh, hypertensive patients, you see that there were differences in terms of uh, a left ventricular mass compare, comparing a patient with a, a confirmed nocturnal uh, dipping and patient with a confirmed uh, nocturnal non-dipping in uh, a 48 hour uh, ABPM. So although uh, uh, this was just a, a single study, it tells us that uh, if we phenotype properly our patients in terms of the dipping status and therefore in terms of their 24-hour uh, blood pressure profile can certainly uh, be of help. And we can potentially do this if we measure nocturnal blood pressure routinely in our practice. Now, uh, the last uh, uh, answer that I, I, I will try to give you is, is something we have seen in, in the previous pre presentation. So in patients with sleep disorders, of course, uh, assessing nocturnal blood pressure can be really of help. Uh, um, we'll go uh, quickly through obstructive sleep apnea that we have seen already before, the uh, repetitive obstructions causing um, hypoxia and therefore uh, blood pressure rises in, in obese patients in particular. But um, just remember, remember that um, uh, patients with non-dipping nocturnal blood pressure are at high risk of sleep apnea. And therefore, uh, it's important to detect uh, if our patient, hypertensive patient do have a non-dipping non nocturnal blood pressure because this can give us a hint or can suggest us to investigate the presence of, of sleep disorders and in particular uh, sleep disorder breathing. Um, uh, interestingly, this uh, study from the Brazilian group published a couple of years ago uh, showed that, that um, a reverse systolic dipper was in independently associated with uh, sleep apnea. So again, we have another important information, the assessment of the dipping status of our patients. And uh, um, uh, uh, the, the group of uh, professors Tergio uh, in Greece uh, tested whether uh, the assessment of nighttime blood pressure using a, a, a home uh, BP monitor was, was feasible and was uh, uh, useful in patients with, with, with sleep apnea. And in fact, the severity of sleep apnea was associated with, uh, with nocturnal blood pressure measured, measured uh, with uh, such devices. So again, this tool can in fact be important. We know that some treatments for sleep disorder breathing like continuous positive airway pressure can in fact reduce blood pressure, particularly at night. And this can be one of the tools that we can recommend to our patients uh, instead of um, uh, requesting ABPMs, which we know that uh, are not often available in many, many other, in many centers worldwide.
So on top of sleep disorder breathing, sometimes we forget about insomnia, but insomnia can be quite uh, a trouble for our patients, in particular for hypertensive patients. This was a, a, an ABPM trace that I've uh, uh, taken from uh, a patient in our lab. As you can see, uh, the, I mean, the patient's uh, pole pressure is all over the place, but of course the patient didn't sleep uh, that much at night. And this can, of course, um, cause a misclassification of their dip dipping status if we, do if we don't better understand what's going on at night. And therefore, again, a, um, a home-based uh, blood pressure assessment of, of nocturnal blood pressure can really be of help in patients with insomnia and also in patients in patients with uh, um, circadian rhythm disorders or shift work. This was a, a nurse uh, attending uh, my clinic. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this shouldn't happen, but sometimes happens, um, had his ABPM during a night shift. So as you can see, he had uh, a nap uh, in, the, in the afternoon before the, the night and then uh, a night shift when he was working uh, wide awake and then asleep for a couple of hours after 3 a.m. or so. And then when he, his uh, shift uh, ended, he went home and, and had another nap uh, in the early afternoon. So as you can see, it's very difficult to understand the real nocturnal blood pressure of a patient like this. So again, um, having the chance to recommend nocturnal blood pressure um, uh, measurements in patients like this with a, with a device that, that can be carried home uh, and uh, can really be of help and, uh, to, to us clinicians. So, um, uh, as, as, as uh, we have seen in Professor Prati's presentation as well, uh, this device, this night, night view, can in, in fact provide such information. Uh, I believe that there are some uh, specific patients that we sh should consider recommending uh, nocturnal blood pressure measurement at home because this can really help us understanding the, their blood pressure profile. And um, I will leave, we, leave you with uh, uh, just a few take-home messages. Uh, we've seen that um, a routine blood pressure nocturnal measurement can in fact allow uh, to, to determine blood pressure at night uh, without disturbing the patient that much, at least compared to ABPM. Uh, and in some times it can even overcome the low reproducibility of, 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 uh, of such tests, given the uh, multiple uh, measurements that can be conducted over time. Um, and lastly, as discussed uh, in patients with sleep disorders, uh, such devices can be really of help, not only sleep disorder breathing, but also other sleep disorders such as insomnia and circadian rhythm disorders. Uh, let me leave you with the, this last uh, take home message, which is, is very uh, striking to me, a uh, condition, uh, condition like nocturnal um, hypertension, which is a known independent predictor of cardiovascular events, is commonly defined and managed based only on few poorly reproducible uh, ABPM measurements, which usually do not discriminate whether the patient is, a, is asleep or not. So more research is needed in this field. And for sure, such devices like the uh, home blood pressure monitors uh, for uh, nocturnal blood pressure can help. And I thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pengo. It's a very interesting and um, complementary presentation to the previous two. Uh, I'd like to open down the question and answers. And I'll, I'll, um, we are receiving questions. I'll try to put them together and take as many as possible. If I may start with a couple of questions put in together in one to Professor Parati. Uh, the questions are, which blood pressure medications are best suited to tackle nocturnal hypertension? And the additional question would be, would it be any difference? Are you aware of any difference between classes of antihypertensive drugs in uh, addressing blood pressure variability at night? And these are a very important question, actually, touching a practical issue on which, honestly, uh, and unfortunately, we don't have so much evidence from uh, randomized trials. Starting from the last question, blood pressure variability, well, uh, there are a few uh, studies suggesting that calcium channel blockers might perform better than others in buffering blood pressure variability. This has been shown 
considering short-term variability, 24-hour blood pressure variability, not so much focusing on nighttime blood pressure variability, but this might apply as well. Although a formal comparison is uh, not yet available, is on the way, by the way. We have started a few years ago the reverend study, a study in hypertensive, including a center in uh, Italy, in Greece, and in China, comparing an ACE inhibitor and a CCB in their effects on blood pressure variability. And the results are going to be available shortly. So I think we have to wait a few more months probably to have at least some experimental data. Concerning the night, that's a, a really uh, an interesting question, but again, without formal studies. Certainly, when you include the vasodilation and you reduce the contractility of the heart, you modulate the neural control of the cardiovascular system, you may reduce blood pressure both during the day and the night. So we have to stick at the moment with the recommendation that is not a specific drug class which can best reduce blood pressure. In general, any drug class might work, provided this is chosen based on the individual profile. Personalized medicine means that we have to choose drugs in this field that are active in this specific subject. This might apply to the night as well. So probably we have to go and try, depending on what we know about the patient profile and cardiovascular regulation, to make our choice. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm picking another two questions to put together to Dr. Pingle, if you don't mind. The one of the audience is asking, does CPAP have an effect on nocturnal blood pressure? And the other thing is related to sleep disturbances. Does sleep paralysis increase the risk of nocturnal hypertension? I put those two together because these are sleep disorders. Of course. Well, these are the two different but, but interesting questions, I have to say. So firstly, um, we know that uh, CPAP uh, is the most effective treatment for sleep apnea uh, so far. And it can certainly induce um, uh, blood pressure lowering effect in a patient, hypertensive patient in particular. However, the overall effect in the most recent meta-analysis is quite modest, if you, uh, if you want, because it's around uh, two millimeters of mercury for systolic blood pressure, which is not that much. Um, however, uh, there are certain phenotypes that respond better in a way. Uh, so uh, we have conducted our... Um, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis published last year when we tried to identify such phenotypes. And in fact, it appeared that a uh, patient with a uh, high systolic and diastolic blood pressure values at base length, so before treatment, um, young patients and patients with severe uh, hypoxia during uh, the sleep apnea testing were uh, associated with a greater um, uh, decrease of raw pressure after treatment with CPAP. So this can certainly help in understanding who can respond the most, also in terms of, uh, of course, uh, blood pressure reduction and um, an improvement of cardiovascular prevention. So I would say yes, uh, as an answer to the question, but uh, even uh, more yes uh, for particular phenotype of, of patients, which must, uh, of course, be uh, studied in uh, future randomized controlled uh, studies. But uh, uh, in particular, patients with resistant hypertension, I would say that will certainly uh, uh, experience a, a significant uh, and convincing effect on blood pressure, much more than the um, say, grade one uh, hypertensive patients. Now, related to the second question, uh, sleep paralysis is a, a phenomenon of, of sleep uh, which is present in some conditions such, such as narcolepsy. Uh, well, that is not a cause itself of, uh, on, of nocturnal uh, hypertension. However, um, usually it is associated with arousals from sleep. It is usually associated with other conditions that can increase uh, blood pressure. For example, just a, a, a very quick example, patients with narcolepsy are treated with stimulants, such as modafinil and other, and, and other stimulants that ca can themselves increase blood pressure. So certainly the narcolect uh, narcoleptic patients are some uh, are a subgroup that should be taken uh, uh, into consideration for nocturnal hypertension. But again, uh, sleep paralysis itself is not something that can uh, completely mess up uh, nocturnal blood pressure profile, in my opinion. 
Yeah. Uh, so, Capuccio, there are a couple of yes. questions for you, I guess, that you might answer properly. <laughs> One is, uh, what is the influence of salt restriction on non-DP profile? Yes. And the other one is, what is uh, the possible link between sleep deprivation and hypertension, both ways? Yes, yes. So, uh, obviously, for the first question, you probably should be more expert than me because you've done more studies on the effect of nocturnal uh, on salt sensitivity on non-DP profile. So, I, I think some study on salt restriction, the salt um, excretion doesn't have a diurnal regular variation, but varies from day to night. So, in general, um, because the uh, the load to the kidney increases the flow at night due to posture and reduction in activity, um, there is a difference in the way you when you restrict salt. The studies they've, sh they've shown, they've studied uh, nocturnal blood pressure during salt restriction, not many. Um, it seems that salt-resistant individuals have less uh, of an effect on nocturnal blood pressure when using salt, which, as you also have postulated, may be in part contributing to the higher risk. Um, now, obviously, on the, who is salt-sensitive, salt-resistant is another issue. Because like for ABPM, if you repeat the same test and define individuals, you don't have a great concordance. So we know in general, salt restriction where you have other conditions like sleep apnea syndrome, I would predict uh, a salt restriction would be contributing probably more to the reduction in the hypertensive surge at night. But this is your touching an area which would require far more specifically designed studies rather than using um, opportunistic observations for study done for other reasons, because it's a very complex way of standardizing the conditions to look at the pathophysiology, let's say, compared to a phenomenon. But in principle, salt reduction in those who respond during the day might favor a, a reduction in nighttime uh, non dp for instance. Uh, the question about the link between uh, sleep deprivation and hypertension, I think I've touched in the, in the presentation by showing the effect of sustained sleep uh, reduction, short sleep, uh, to prospective incidence of hypertension. In other words, it is believed definitely that short reduction, uh, sleep reduction precedes the development of hypertension. That can be a contributing cause, like a behavioral additional cause, like uh, obesity, lack of exercise, and is visible already in the short term. In a trial of six weeks, you can see beautifully the effect on blood pressure by just a one hour change in six weeks. So it's a very rapid effect and is reversible. Now, the other way around, where the hypertension would cause sleep disruption, unlike other conditions, uh, we don't have any evidence, nor do we have any plausible mechanism, unless they are mediated through other factors. And that comes to my mind, those obstructive sleep apnea, of course. So you have hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea. You can argue that if you don't know the person has sleep apnea, you can argue that because they have high blood pressure, they have a, a disruptive sleep. But then you find out that it's confounded by the macroarousals and all the pattern. So I'm not aware of any study clearly indicating, but just essential hypertension itself causes sleep disturbances. Like for instance, other cases is, is the question between obesity and sleep uh, deprivation, which is a different issue where there are more uh, uh, there's more evidence that obesity, for instance, may um, affect some patterns of uh, sleep uh, in disturbing it. So at the moment we have a unidirectional evidence which has mechanisms for plausibility. We don't have it the other way around. I have, can I pick up another? There was another thing I want to get to, uh, Professor Parati, and this is this one here. Right, and with this is just for somebody. Are, um, are these blood, blood pressure measurements data, mortality data that you showed um, valid in the case of blood pressure measured with invasive way, let's say with um, intra-arterial blood pressure? In other words, are they an artifact or, or are they just reflecting the effect of blood pressure on the vascular system, I suppose, this is the way. Uh, John Franco, that's, please. that's an interesting question, actually, and you remember, uh, in our institution, both in Radcliffe and in Milano, many, many years ago, we started with the intraarterial ambulatory blood pressure monitoring with the so-called Oxford system. At those times, it was the only way 
to measure blood pressure continuously and in particular during the night because the current uh, oscillometric devices were not available uh, or just at the very, very early phase. In our initial study, actually, we found that bit by bit recording with the interarterial approach was providing important uh, prognostic information when focusing on blood pressure variability in its different components, including the short term changes and also the day night changes. So, certainly, even the few studies performing this way, and this was done years ago, we were able to confirm the prognostic value of nocturnal blood pressure. Obviously, now it would not be ethical to use intraarterial monitoring in, in clinical research because we have different technologies, even for continuous monitoring, that might be performed non-invasively. But if I can just expand a little bit my answer, also considering another question that was raised, and which is, what is the best way to manage uh, blood pressure monitoring during the night and whether this can be included in the guidelines given the evidence we have. Well, certainly the interest towards nocturnal blood pressure has been raising a lot over the last few years. In the initial guidelines, even in those focusing on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, Francesco, you may remember that, the focus was on daytime blood pressure only. Even in the uh, NICE guidelines in UK, remember, few years ago, 2011, when the NICE guidelines were among the first to recommend ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. They only focus on daytime blood pressure, and I still honestly cannot understand this even now. <laughs> anyway, uh, now the uh, uh, attitude has changed a lot, given the important evidence we are gathering on nocturnal blood pressure importance. Now in the current APPN guidelines, there is already an indication to use nocturnal blood pressure. And in the general hypertension guidelines, even in the very recent ones, you find evidence that monitoring blood pressure for 24 hours can be important because you can have information also on nighttime blood pressure. We don't have yet guidelines for home nocturnal blood pressure, obviously, because we are in the very early stage of the research and clinical application of this technology, but it will be interesting in the future to get prognostic data also with this approach. Also because it might give you, as you remember, reminded us before, more reproducible information on nocturnal blood pressure than just one shot you obtain with the ABPN for once. Home blood pressure monitoring several days can be interesting because it might provide more reproducible assessment. Thank you, Jim Franco. I, I'm tempted, yeah, I think I'm going to get the last question to Dr. Penga because I, I'm conscious of time. Uh, I would beg you to be short, Martino. I, I'm putting two questions together. First of all, um, sleep disturbances with circadian misalignment, you mentioned shift work, that's what I'm saying, are associated with higher cardiovascular risk. And the first question is, can you envisage an advantage in the synchronous monitoring of blood pressure and sleep during the sleep-wake cycle, which I think was in your conclusion? And I have another associated question, how do you see the future of night view in managing nocturnal hypertension? Well, uh, so I'll try to be very, very brief. So firstly, uh, as far as circadian uh, rhythm disorders is, are concerned, uh, well, um, yeah, uh, there are some studies done on that specific aspect of sleep disorders. Uh, however, uh, as I, I've explained in my, in my presentation, it's very difficult to capture um, blood pressure profiles in some such patients, given the very complex uh, uh, misalignment of sleep uh, in these patients. So I believe that um, uh, it, there are several path, uh, pathways uh, implicated in the potential uh, association between such sleep disorders and, and hypertension. But of course, I, I believe that more studies are needed and to better identify what is the real uh, nocturnal blood pressure in such patients, given the, uh, the difficulties in, in assessing, the, assessing it uh, with the ABPM. And uh, um, uh, with, with regards to the second question, uh, I believe that a night view can be of help uh, for all the cases in which we need uh, to um, uh, measure uh, blood pressure at night uh, uh, routinely uh, and uh, th this is uh, this regards particularly patient with, with uh, again sleep disorders or or nocturnal blood pressure hypertension due to other causes, because uh, although 
we uh, still not uh, have RCTs, uh, as Professor Parati said, um, uh, confirming that treating an blood pressure can be of help uh, in terms of reducing uh, this patient's cardiovascular risk. Uh, I believe that uh, it could be really ho of help um, to better investigate blood pressure uh, at night over time. Uh, and certainly to um, identify more clearly which are the patterns uh, in terms of dipping states that we yep. are looking for uh, in, in particular cohort of patients. Thanks very much. That's wonderful, Pedro. Uh, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Um, we hope that you find these sessions both informative and engaging. And I'd like, first of all, to thank Radcliffe for Cardiology for organizing the session and Omron for supporting it. A, a reminder, this event will be viewed again on demand at www.radcliffecardiology.com. I would also like to thank our good faculty today and good friends, Professor Parati and Dr. Pingo. And thank you all for joining us and goodbye. <laughs>